All right, we are live, and I'm excited today. I've got uh, a friend of mine who I met a few years ago, a couple years ago actually. I was at a, the Hyde Park Street Fair in Boise, and I was selling some healthy coffee. You know, it was one of the things I was I was doing at the time. Done a lot of things, and Patrick showed up and started asking about what this stuff was. And from that, we uh, we had a long conversation and ended up meeting again after that uh, that street fair and it was, it was one of those individuals I became really uh, really curious about really interested in a real very background uh, again like this is a guy who's got a degree in kinesiology um, was it what's this one? graduate degree in education in education um, environmental education the guy has uh, he's a weightlifting the USA weightlifting national coach um, NSCA certified strength and, and conditioning specialist guys huge background the time that I met him, he shared with me information about Olympic style weightlifting because he could tell back then I had some traps, so I was kind of bulky and I was did a lot of powerlifting uh, practices. So I would I was doing powerlifting like deadlift, squats, bench, you know, stuff that we've all done and stuff that we thought was the best stuff ever. And Patrick's like, oh no no, it's good. He says, but there's something better. He started showing me about weight uh, Olympic style weightlifting and the return on investment and the results you get from that type of, of lifting. And so really got something that I was passionate about. We started discussing that. We started talking about nutrition. We started talking again then about life philosophies. And one of the most interesting individuals that genuinely I've ever met. And it was crazy because I'm super excited about working with this guy. He's going to show me how to do Olympic style weightlifting. He says, oh, but by the way, I might be going to Africa. Like, what are you talking about going to Africa? So this is a guy who was in the Peace Corps. So he packed up his bags and split to the Peace Corps, and the only time I was able to really communicate with him or hear from him was on Facebook. He put some posts and occasionally some emails. So I was incredibly excited when you got back, and you uh, sent out, I think, an email to all your friends that, that he's back in the States. And so I've been waiting for this interview for two years. So I'm excited to have Patrick Corbett. This is going to be one of those conversations that's going to be kind of broad. We're going to touch on some weightlifting. We're going to touch on some nutrition. And then we're really going to just dive into what Patrick's about, his life philosophy. So welcome, Patrick. Thanks so much for taking time, man, to be here. Thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. And um, Troy's really... Uh, He's, he's bubbly and he's got a lot of enthusiasm and he, he's a joy to be around and I, I appreciate this uh, opportunity. Well, thanks, man. Well, it's, uh, yeah, thanks. I like bubbly. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll put that as a tagline, bubbly. But I appreciate it. I, I am. I'm excited about it. Like you and I were just talking before we hit um, record that one of the things that you're passionate about uh, is to give back. One of the things that I'm super passionate about as well is just what I've learned that took me from a place that, frankly, was kind of a tragic place in my life. I think a lot of people end up there, whether it's in one area of their life or in a lot of areas of their life, and then the processes and the people and the things that happened, uh, the resources, basically, that have helped me to live this magic life. It's, it's still full of challenges, thank God. Uh, it's juicy, it's fun, but it's a really fulfilling life. And so one of the things that I know that this, this is about um, is sharing those people back. You're one of those individuals. You're one of those people that have that passion that you've got. You live life to its fullest. And I really feel like you've got an amazing um, uh, perspective on how life should be lived. And so I'm excited to dig into those those conversations. Tell us real quick, what are you up to right now? I know you're back in Boise. What's, what's going on? Well, right when I got back from the Peace Corps, um, I was just right into it. I taught at Boise State. I was teaching the TRIO program, which is a great program for first-generation college kids. Oh, cool. And first-generation college is like their parents didn't go to Right, school. right, oh, no. yeah. And it was great because I got to use all the great technology at Boise State, and they gave me a lot of autonomy, So, which is, of course, what I really like. And I was able to do a lot of things with health, nutrition. It was a health class, oh, cool. so it was, it was a really good opportunity. Then right at the last minute, the Boise School District hired me, so now I'm teaching at West Junior High. I'm teaching PE and earth science, so I get to do things in the physical realm as well as use my environmental science background to teach, you know, young kids, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. I was the head wrestling coach. We just finished our season up, and then I coached uh, a football team that went nine and zero, and we won the city championship. And really great staff and administration and guys I coach with. Pretty dang fortunate. That's cool, so, and that's really your passion is that is teaching and. Teaching, right, at, at any level, you know, right. and just, again, like you said, the, the giving back thing, so many people have given 
to me, my parents, uh, the, the the wisdom, and then my mentors are a who's who of some of the best coaches and people that I've ever met. And uh, can you name them? Yeah. Uh, yeah, my my the first guy is Bart Templeman. He uh, he coached me in three sports in high school, and he really rode me. He got after me, and uh, I, again, it was I don't know if it was love hate relationship, but man, he. We really, and he knew he could push my buttons, and I would, I would react. And then after that, we just became really close. I don't know how he let me drive his car to the prom because I didn't oh, have wow. any money, and it, I was close with his wife, and and they just really were secondary parents, like you know a lot of people have. But uh, these these two, just the integrity, and he's a bigger than life guy, you know. Cool. He, he fills the room. He's a big guy. He played professional football, wow. and he's one of the best coaches that I've ever seen. What's he up? he uh, he he went to Beijing for the 2008 games, and he's he's now down at the training center. I work with him a lot. He started what is now the biggest throwers camp in the world. Really? And we attract at this camp. It's called Ironwood Throwers Camp. We attract gold medalists, ex world record holders, the first guy to throw 60 meters in the disc, the first guy to throw 70 meters in the discus. Guys from all over the world come to this camp. Hammer, javelin, you name it, they come to this camp. And great kids. I can't. I, I think one year we had kids who would come to the Ironwood camp. I think 80% of the throwers at the Olympics were ex-Ironwood throwers oh, wow. for the U.S. team. That's huge. Yeah. And now one of the ex-Ironwood throwers, who's a two-time Olympian from Boise State, Jared Rome, he now is the camp director. Bart retired from it. He still works it. And this is the 25th anniversary, so they want me to come up there and do the strength and conditioning part of the camp. So. That's, that's very cool. It sounds like Bart was the guy that pushed you further than you knew you could go. He knew you had more in you. Well, again, he's one of those guys that he's bigger than life. When, when he comes in the room, the light kind of shines on him. But <laughs> cool. he wants to shine the light on you. He's humble. He's uh, Again, he, he doesn't care about anything. He doesn't want to be in the paper. He just wants to give back just like I'm talking about. And secondly is a Mike Conra, who is the National Education Director for USA Weightlifting. I've just been fortunate. Wherever I've landed, the top coach has been there. When I coached wrestling in Arizona, Hall of Fame wrestling coach. When I coached here in Boise, Hall of Fame wrestling coaches. And how often do you get to do that with all these sports? And then in football, I had great coaches all the way through high school and at Boise State. And the guys I played with, same thing, all Americans and just Really, I've I've been really fortunate. <laughs> just a lot of championship mindsets. Yeah, and just, and good people. Yeah, and, and that really makes the difference between a good coach and a great coach, in my opinion. There's a lot of really good coaches out there, mm -hmm. but that 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 persona, and when they can take it just a, to a, another place, mm -hmm. that it, that's not just about the sport or winning, which you know we we tend to dwell on a little bit too much. Yeah. These guys are about developing a human being more than anything else. You know, the success will come or not, but being successful is is is, is such a broad thing. You right. know, and all of these people that uh, were my mentors, boy, the people that under their umbrella just can't say enough good things about these people. That's cool. And, that is a super blessing. Yeah, and again, I've been around these guys, and I'm always around them. I'm either with Bard or with Conroy or somewhere else, and boy, that it just spills right into me. Yeah. And so, yeah, I've been able to work with Olympic athletes, Olympic coaches at the training centers, both in Colorado Springs and in Chula Vista. So, yeah, I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't be more fortunate. More <laughs> well, you try, or that's one of those conversations that I think are super important to people. I heard it said. Uh, that you'll never outperform your inner circle, you know. And a lot of times, I think one of the most challenging things for people to do is to get very clear that some relationships doesn't mean they have to be completely out of your life, but you've got to limit your quantity amount of time because it matters on more than more levels than people are really even aware of. That just the energy of an individual, what they're thinking, those things affect us on a level. I know you're definitely in involved with that type of of, of training, so it's cool that you've had the opportunity to be around those types of folks because it definitely it changes your, our lives in a huge, huge way. Well, they don't, and again, these these guys, they don't just. It doesn't end with, with the the practice. Yeah. You know, there's so much more to it. Even though you might not have you know direct contact with them, 
there's something that happens after practice, and they're available all the time. That's another thing. They're, they're, they're so given, you know, and they don't miss, and they don't let you down. Mm. And uh, no matter how you slice it, someone close to you will let you down in some way. But these guys, you know, they're I, – I, I, it's, it's hard to describe. It's, it's like your parents. You know, they, they're, they're just there. And they don't do the right thing because you're, they're, you know, they do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because mm -hmm. someone says this is the right thing. No, they, it's just the right thing to do, not because, you know, someone deserves it or they earned it. No, it's you just do the right thing because that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And that's these guys, you know. And so, and you hear it all the time. I, I hope I can I live up. And they don't have expectations of me, you know. They, they leave it on the table. They leave it for you to figure out which I really appreciate because I find myself over-explaining things to younger kids. And I, I don't know if we have to do that, but I, I think I tend to do that too much. And I try not to spoon-feed. They didn't spoon-feed me. They made me figure it out on my own, which they knew I could do. Yeah. But uh, it, it's, it's difficult for me to pull that rein back and just let kids figure it out for themselves because people want results so fast. Yeah. And, so, and you're under that pressure. Okay, we want results now. So you think, well, I gotta keep feeding them so they get that result. And hopefully, I can learn to do it a little bit better. <laughs> no, I, I relate to that. Yeah. I mean, that guy that is like, oh, more. You know, if, if you like that, you're gonna love this. Whereas there's, it seems like there's a there's a time frame that people can absorb some information. They can really internalize it, and then actually begin to apply that in their lives. And one of the things that I've found for myself is I I've got to talk, thing, speak it. And then generally I'll think it, then I'll speak it, and then kind of see if I believe it, and then start moving my feet, and then start creating habits. And sometimes, and then the, in the process of creating the habit, you know, it'll be imperfect for sure. I'll, I'll drop the ball, and then I'll get back on track. But eventually, if it's really something that's valuable to me, I'll create that consistency, and then I'll own it. And then it's part of my new my new toolbox I carry forward. Right. But man, I, I get what you're saying. I, you, we want for people sometimes more than maybe they even see as possible for themselves and I've had to really rein back because I get up on a soapbox and I just proselytize and it's it's really important for for me to remind myself that it's, it's about where meeting people where they're at because I definitely like I want to be met where I'm at as well and I know you but you're really invested with in a lot of like teaching at the junior high level now you've taught at the college level you're a coach you're doing a lot of things and, and as far as like what Pat says about being re responsive and available. I mean, this is a guy who's super busy, and I shot him an email like two days ago. I was like, "Hey, man, will you come on the show? Will you uh, will you do an interview with me?" And sure enough, man, gave me a couple times, and here he is. I appreciate that, man. It's meaningful. Well, yeah, and 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 we can always fill our time with with something else, but you know, what's that downtime? You know, what is is it, is it useful? And that that really reminds me of a couple other things. We don't always have to be useful. There's mm. there's certainly times and we talk to the young athletes who are really overachievers and just yeah. fill their plate too much. You know, there's just like your body needs rest, so does your brain, so does your spirit. Take that time. The day that you're not, you know, productive is not a failed day. Just sit and just be instead of trying to become all the time. You know, we were so, oh, I have to be. No, we don't always have to be doing. You know, not doing is still doing. <laughs> you know, and... I use a lot of Eastern philosophy in, in my, my teaching and coaching and really make it simple. Simple things simply stated over and over again. Mm -hmm. Master the simple, move on to the complex. And even though it might be the same thing, but it's going to be simply stated, okay, let's figure out a new way to do this because every athlete, every student has a different view of what you're teaching and they're individuals. You can't just give the whole group this thing and say, okay, be successful with it. It just doesn't work that way. It's going to be more on the individual level. And, and it's still difficult to reach. You know, if you have a class of 30 kids, you know, you're not going to have time to reach each kid every day. I mean, you might not reach some of them at all because for whatever reason, they you don't click or they're quiet and they just kind of come into class. You can do your best. So, again, try to, you know, make the tiers – so that everybody can step onto that tier and learn, you know, learn something. Know where they're at. And again, for for teaching, one of my pet peeves is really 
the content, great, but teaching them how to think is yeah. so important. And not what to think, just, okay, is there a different way that we can approach this? How about, you know, what do you guys think of what I'm telling you? You know, yeah. do, you, do you like the way I'm speaking? It, are, are, we, are we connecting? Because, and again, you're not going to get a lot of answers from younger kids because they're shy and they're so self-conscious. Right. So you just you, you play around with it and find out what reaches a class. Because a lot of times a class will respond because they have a certain dynamic, you know. And that's again that's that's a tr that's a trick. That's, that's a that's a talent and you know art. What it's an art form for sure, right? Yeah. Make sure every kid is picking up what you're laying down, right? Because right. everyone's internalizing that information differently. Well, another another part of uh, teaching weightlifting is the whole part whole whole method. You show the hole, you teach the parts to reach back to the hole. And it works great in, in teaching too. You know, you can't, it'd be like looking at the environmental crisis. You know, if you look at the whole thing, whoa, that's way too big. Okay, let's look at it locally. In fact, let's look at it right here. Mm -hmm. You know, just maybe on our campus or at our house. You know, tell me about your ecosystem. At just surrounding your house, in your, in your, in your room. You know, what's, what's the air like? You know, break it down to the small parts and then you know, push that in, oh, I see how this connects with this and this connects with that. Same thing in weightlifting, no different, you know. Why am I not doing this? Well, because this part of your your movement, you're, you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And another thing, like, uh, and again, taking from the old sages, I guess old is, is not the appropriate word, but older sages like uh, John Wooden, you know, don't use the word win too much or the word success, you know, and don't show poor technique. Here's what you did wrong. No, just show the corrected technique. Nice. This is the way to do it. Because that's what we're coding in. That's right. What we're right. And then another great thing I learned in one of my grad classes for education was uh, non-binding language. This really helps. And the first time I used it, I used it with my dad and my sister. And non-binding language means not using the words I, you, we, us, nothing like that. So they they both were asking me and. I can kind of be a pain in the rump about nutrition and health and that thing, kind of thing. And a lot of times I'll say, guys, if you don't want to know, don't yeah. ask me. And I'm certain, I certainly have, you know, there's still a huge, we're learning so much more about health, but sadly in America we're so urban legend oriented. We've got to get into that. Let's get into that next after the, after the binding language because I know that you're passionate about that. But yeah, the uh, non-binding language, so I'd say, okay, hmm, so what would be the best nutritional program? I That's a question. That's not an IU. Right, and I didn't say, I think you should do this instead of <laughs> just when you leave it open and, oh, yeah, that doesn't that doesn't bind me to anything. Because when you think I need to, instantly it seems like a human behavior is like, well, I'm not going to do that. Defense mechanisms <laughs> prop up and et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's hard to do because we're so I-oriented. Yeah. And for me, when I can take the word I out of my vocabulary, I know I will have evolved to maybe a... Another level, hopefully, but it's it's hard. It is hard not to use the word I. I well, I, I and you, and just keeping it. Like, it, it seems like it's a more caring way of, of communicating with someone because like put it's putting putting it on the table and saying, what do you think about that? Yeah. Instead of like I think and you should. Right. Those things are those were really uh, like in your face type statements. Right. Know? And I use them all the time, but I'm gonna work on it. And there's this great book by Rachel Carson who wrote Silent Spring, which is more or less the uh, the catalyst for the current environmental movement started in the 60s. Yeah. And it's a great book, but she wrote a book called A Sense of Wonder, and it's about her relationship with her nephew. Mm -hmm. And when she went out into nature, she didn't say, well, this this plant does this. She, she just she would walk to the, to the coast with her, and she would just say, oh, this is my favorite flower. It's so pretty. And let him discover it on his own. She wouldn't say, hey, come look at this. Just let him find out on his own. And eventually, he wanted to stay up past dark, because curious. All, all the yeah, he, she just created a sense of wonder, hence the name of the book, because she didn't use science to teach. She just used, you know, a kid's natural senses, which we all have. And again, it's tough when you're in a classroom and and it's you know it's kind of sterile. Even the teachers really make it nice and you know friendly, but it's still it's really structured and. We kind of clamp it because we have to do this, 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 and this to get to this point right. to finish this test. Which, you know, you have some kind of standard, but boy, it's tough to teach a lot of uh, 
really open-mindedness when you're when the, the atmosphere is not open. Even though the teacher can create that, yeah. it's kind of tough when you don't when we don't go outside. You know, we don't experience the world and we don't touch it. Yeah. You know, so yeah, and you do your best you can. It's 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 best you can. It's kind of tough, but uh, it. I think we're doing a little bit better now, and and we're opening up to that a little bit more, just because teachers are are not really happy with the ster sterility of current trends. Well, do you feel like people are and teachers just we're seeing the results <clears throat> and the outcomes of the way things have been done for so long, and it's let's say it's producing like broken people, I don't think that's necessarily it. It's just like that there's this very clear knowing now from a lot of people that there's there's more ways than one to do this, that, there, that we need more than what has been taught for so long. Sure, and education, the system in, you know, in the United States, you know, it, it, it throws all kinds of new, you know, this, this has been shown to be great at this place, but again, it's, it's like anything else. It worked here because of of this group of people and these students now, no matter how you slice it, you know classes are cyclical, just mm -hmm. like athletes. And every year you get a different dynamic. This might not work at all for these guys. Now, there are certain programs that have been shown statistically to work pretty well, and they have some new ones that are working pretty well in the Boise School District right now. But again, you might you might have a, a cycle of kids that came from completely different backgrounds and. The, the the numbers will go down or the success rate so it's it's fluid it's like it's like life you know it's okay so it's hard to hang your hat on just one way to do it but from my experience when I was teaching at the uh, McCall Outdoor Science School it's called Moss <laughs> Outdoor Education I have seen nothing that works better you can you can literally teach every subject outside outside and, and we did. did yeah science English because we had them writing, you know, they had the tools to write with, they experienced it, uh, science especially, of course, um, math, you know, calculating things, and because it was, it was hands-on, they were out doing it, hmm. you know, and, and you hear this a lot, you know, when you interview for teaching jobs, well, how do, how do, how do children learn? I know, of course, you say this and that, but you know, by doing, <laughs> right. isn't, isn't that how they learn from the time they're born till now? And that was the great thing about the cool. is just, yeah, they were doing it. Doing it, is, and they were out in nature where, you know, when you, we, we spent a lot of time in our, in our history outside, and we've really gone inside and become distracted through media and different things to keep us, uh, well, I've got my own opinions on that, but being back outside and being connected, I can imagine that it just it brings people a uh, more sense of self, a more sense of connection. Right. Well, we're so separated from nature. We're so separated from nature, and urban settings are are just that's where jobs are. So that's where people gravitate to. And then a a, a suburb, you know, it's you know it might have some kind of personality, but you know most people do they know their neighbor three houses over? Maybe. You know, because they go to work, they come home, and then they're in their home. Yeah. And, you know, you see the names of a lot of these suburbs, you know, Quail Hollow. Well, it's because that's what they killed to build the <laughs> suburb. You know, these That's what it was here. Yeah. So-and-so, the tr oak trees. Well, where are the oak trees? Right. Oak Grove. So, well, they're not there unless someone plants them. So we have that. And then, again, we have so so much of our time spent going to and from and my experience in Africa, most of the people who traveled throughout Africa were Europeans, some Asians, some Australians, but mostly Europeans. And of course, proximity plays a huge place because they're right above Africa and the U.S. is so far away. But, you know, they get six to eight weeks off a year. We get one or two, maybe, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. we work way more uh, and we have way more stuff. Are we, are we way more productive? I don't know. The Africans are pretty happy, and I know a lot of Europeans are pretty happy with less, smaller homes, smaller everything. They don't have all the material things. And again, that's that's another subject altogether. Yeah, it's a little big, fascinating conversation. Right. You know, because I know it's a hot topic, you know, especially with what's going on in the country and where it's going from, you know, with, with the democracy. It's a whole other conversation. But I think it's really fascinating because it really comes down to uh, how do we feel? You know, how do we feel? Are we happy? 
you know, is it better? Is more better? And that, again, we'll, we'll have to have you back on and talk <laughs> about that. Well, yeah, that's that's actually another uh, one of the Achilles' heels of education is the kids are so distracted, you know, with whatever media they're connected to, and. I did a, an experiment in Africa when I was teaching at the university. I said, and and they don't have this distraction now. They have, they have a lot. They have iPads. They have cell phones. You know, they're not as high as high tech, but they have quality stuff over there. It's just not the mass of people don't have it. But the college students had it. And uh, so one day we were we were we were talking about uh, going back into your village and creating some uh, some rubbish pits because. Up until 10 years ago, they didn't have plastic bags, and now Sub-Saharan Africa is just littered with plastic bags of cheap plastic, and they're everywhere. They're in the water, they're in the farmland, mm. and they didn't have any. They didn't have any way to, you know, get rid of it because they didn't have trash. Everything that they created, they either they consumed, mm. you know, they had, and what what they carried stuff in was made from the local grass or made from bamboo. They didn't have fake stuff that now what is the earth going to do with it so they have this and when as we were talking about this okay guys I want you to right now stop write down all the things that maybe half an hour into class write down all the things that have gone through your mind while we're and you know they're writing how many of you have 10 or more everyone raise your hand how many 20 most people so you 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 your mind has been filled with 20 different things and so what happened yesterday, who said this, what do I got to do later, my responsibilities to other classes. Right. Why can't we just focus on this at this moment? You know, or what is it that is distracting us? Mm -hmm. And you talk about, in and I use Einstein's idea of the clarity of thought, and, you know, he could, he could, he could literally sit and contemplate the ray of light coming through a window for hours with, without thinking of anything else. Now it might not have made him a great husband or, or father, and that's again that's well documented. But still, you know, he said this is one of the reasons I'm successful. I am no smarter than anybody else, but I can literally block out everything in my life and contemplate on one thing at a time. And I ask people, you know, just think how good you'd be at any one thing if you could block out everything else. And they said, yeah. And then we talk about multitasking, which seems like a badge of honor yeah, right. to some people. Well, do you think you're going to be better at five things if you're thinking about them, or one? And they all know the answer to that. And but again, it's well, I could do this and this and this. Yeah, but should you? Yeah. It comes back to technology. Well, we can do all these things. Should we? Should we do? <laughs> right. You know, it's it's like the atomic bomb. They were so excited, and this comes from that movie Jurassic Park. They're so excited. You know, to find out if they sh they they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. <laughs> I love that line. It's one I use it a lot, and sometimes I actually show that that clip from Jurassic Park because it's just it's so, thought provoking. So, it really is thought provoking. Yeah, it's because you can it doesn't mean we necessarily should. Yeah. Well, like, let me ask you a question on that with the clarity of thought and focusing on one thing. That also for me kind of brings up being present to what where you're at. What I know from a coaching perspective that you guys have techniques, you guys, um, you've been to different places, you've seen different athletes doing certain things prior to competition. I mean, can you talk about some of the things that people can do to actually narrow it down to have more clarity of thought and focus on one thing? What do you do? Well, there's a, a great line by George Burns, you know, they asked him how... You know, I think he lived to 101, 102. I'm not sure, 103. I don't know if he made it quite to 100, but I could be wrong. I yes. Maybe like 99. But something like that. Anyway, when he was in his 90s, someone asked him, what do you, because he was still getting around, doing great, doing movies, singing. And someone said, how do you, what do you attribute your long life to? And he said, well, you know, because they said, well, you, I smoke five cigars a day and I drink two martinis, three martinis every day. <laughs> he said, well, if I have a problem, before I get to bed, I kick it out and then I go to sleep. And the same thing with uh, athletes. You know, when you come in here, this is what we're doing. So, what do you like the problem? Like uh, something. Something's you bothering you. Okay. You know, maybe uh, maybe you cheated on a test or you didn't do your homework. You know, some simple thing. It doesn't have to be anything drastic, even if it is drastic. Excuse me. But, guys, can you change anything about what's happened in the past? No. What can you do about what's happening later? You know, you're 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 at practice, right? You're committed to this thing. You're you're committed to this training. So, while you're here, is there anything you can do about that other stuff? And they all say, well, no. 
then have fun while you're here, train, and then go on. And it's really simple. And we talk about it a lot. Conroy does also. He said, hey, when you're in here, we don't talk about politics or anything else, even though that stuff slips in, mm -hmm. you know, because some people are interested in that stuff. But most of the time, we don't have music, no music. This is not, you didn't come here to be entertained. Everything is entertainment now. Food is created for entertainment. Entertain our taste buds. Right. You know? <laughs> Everything is created for entertainment, but it's not as a tool, you know, which is okay. Nothing wrong with distractions. It's kind of like the, the juggernaut of Boise State football, yeah. all encompassing. Mm -hmm. Hey, great. You know, they're doing well, small market, and, you know, geez, what a great success story. You know, yeah. really pretty impressive with the small budget they have and, yeah, yeah. you know, the anomaly of the, the blue turf and all that kind of stuff. Really great. One of the greatest college football games in history. Mm -hmm. But, ball. but you know, I, I posed this, this question to my friends, and I can't, I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here, but 43,000 people met Boise State after they beat TCU in the Fiesta Bowl a couple of years ago. And I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty neat. But how about we put some of that energy into something that's maybe going to benefit our society? Mm. You know, how much money do we spend at tailgates? Uh, it's okay for a healthy detraction, but it shouldn't be. You know, we, you know, let's let's put at least some of that money, time, and energy into something that we that's you know that's going to benefit. Children, the homeless, right. there's a million places it could go. And you don't have to give them money, just give them your time. Yeah. You know, just find out about it. You know, we throwing money th at things, that's a Western man's way of dealing. Hey, here's money. But yeah. it, it disconnects you. It, it takes you off the hook. The responsibility ends, you know. You don't know your money's going, but, oh, I did my part. Well, really, did you? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, an, that's an easy, oh, I, I gave it the office type thing. Well... Get involved in it if if you're some if there's something you're passionate about. I I love that. I think that time. You know, my friend Mark Warnke, he uh, has a great book Ono, and in that book he says, you know, like kids, they they spell love T I M E. You know, we really do sh show people what we value most by where we spend our time. Hey, I love my kids. I love my kids. But I spend you know 14 hours a day at the office. Right. I don't have to stop by somewhere on the way home and. and decompress and then you know what I mean yeah. and it, that's been a, that was a real challenging thing for me is that what does that look like and I've had to and consistently still do have to re-analyze my values and then look at where am, am I spending my time and then be honest with myself do I really value this and sometimes I've, I've got to actually be okay with the fact that I silver or bronze medal I heard this from somebody my kids you know I was like, oh, my kids are first in my life. Really? Well, your time is kind of, your calendar dictates if that's true or not. Right. And like you said earlier before we started this, it's like it's a matter of just sitting down and looking them in the eyes, listening to them, you know? And it's it's so simple and sometimes so challenging, you know, just to, to take the time to be with them. Yeah. Because and a lot of it's what you said earlier. It's the distractions. It's the, it's the mind chatter, the shoulds. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. When the reality is, no, oh, man. I'm, I'm here. This is what's the most important thing yeah. that I could be doing possibly right yeah. now. Well, and you know, and we have a lot of martyrs, I think, as as educators, and a lot of parents that are martyrs too. Maybe not intentionally, but you know, I'm going to give sacrifice my whole life for yeah. my kids. But that's 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 I not a very good. I know it's a you know, take care of yourself, be a good role model, and then take care of them. Because if you don't take care of yourself, eventually you won't be able to take care of them. I've been told that I'm very, I'm very, very selfish, and I know that to a degree I am. One of the things I've found is that I just know me. When I'm not healthy, if I'm not eating correctly, if I'm not sleeping uh, enough, and if I'm not moving my body, if I don't, if I don't have physical activity, then I get depressed. I'm cranky. I'm not present, and so I spend a lot of time. I do. I, I've got to schedule that time to work out, to eat right. But what I did is I shifted all those things to be very, very fun for me. I love to grocery shop. I love to cook. I love the gym because I know the outcomes. And I feel amazing. And then when I show up for people, I'm, I'm there. And I'm, and I'm alive. I'm awake. And I'm excited. And so those are the, some of the, the areas of my life that absolutely I'm selfish about. And I absolutely believe that we've got to take care of ourselves first. I spend a lot of time in, you know, with my, my own personal spiritual practice. You know, I want my mind, body, my spirit to be really syncing up. It doesn't always work that way. But... I think that's really important that you you bring that out. That that's most important. If you are not healthy, if we're not healthy, we have nothing to really share, you know, or not as as much as we possibly right. could. 
Yeah. I think, yeah. Well, one of the first things I do in a health class, or even if it's not a health class, I, I have the kids do a little uh, health assessment. And I don't say the word health ever. So, okay, guys, what, like you're talking about, what do you value? And what are your values? And, you know, some will say the dog, their parents, friends. Some will say school. You know, hardly any say health. I say, hmm. So let's say you're really religious and, you know, your, your God, your, your, your faith is really important to you. Or let's say your parents, your dog, your, your skateboard, whatever it is, you know. And then we break it down after that. And how many people value love? Oh, yes. How many people value uh, honesty? You know, those things. You know, we hear the word values. We think money and things and people maybe. But then we go a little farther, and, and I say, uh, okay, so let's say you have these top four priorities. If you're sick or injured, how much time can you spend with them? Will it be quality time? So what is the first thing? Self-care first. And all the great places I've gone to teach, you know, I, I, I worked up with the wolves and this and that I didn't write down there. I, I worked for Defenders of Wildlife, and I was doing wolf research. Wow. And uh, I was actually living up on the mountains at night doing the data collection because that's when wolves are most active. Wow, that's cool. And uh, I climbed at the top of mountains and had to sleep on the top because sheep like to go up at night. So, of course, I had to be above them <laughs> so I could, you know, do all the data collection and listen and hear and that kind of thing. But uh, all the people that I worked with there and at McCall Outdoor Science School said, self-care, take care of yourself first because you're, you're no good to anyone sure. when you're sick and or you're injured. So I even talked to the, with my mom about this because she was never an athlete. But I say, you know, everyone shouldn't be an athlete or, you know, isn't. But everybody should have a degree of athleticism so that they can move confidently in the world. Another thing I did with a buddy of mine, we started an outdoor uh, fitness and uh, roughing it outdoor adventures and fitness because we took them camping, we took them whitewater rafting. A lot of people don't go outside because they have fear. Sure. You know, I, oh, I'll get hurt. You know, I can't do it because I'm not fit. But then, again, giving them that confidence through this little program worked. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I know you're really big on, on nutrition. I know that's a big thing. And it's something that I've been really, really focused on for quite some time, quite a while. You know, I actually had a, I was a, a power lifter when I was in my late teens and early 20s. And back then, it was just eat everything eat everything under the sun, get as big as you possibly can, and then radically diet down. And it was like so completely unhealthy as you, you start to learn, you know, what works and what doesn't work. But I was always, and I still do, I gather information from what people have put out, what they, what I read and what I see on TV, or rather what I saw on TV. And then I would, I would just live that as if it was gospel. And what we've all seen, everybody's experienced it. When you look around, obesity is through the roof. People are sick. People are sicker than ever. More people are on pharma you know, pharmaceuticals and pills than ever. Another conversation. But the reality, like four years ago, you know, it's been six years ago, in 07, when the economy tanked, I thought, you know, here we are. And that really affected my real estate and, constru and, uh, and construction business. And it was literally like getting the re hitting the reset button financially. And at that point, I was 36 years old, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to restart, I'm going to restart my way. And I started treating my body as a science experiment and my mind. You know, I put everything possible I could that was positive in my mind, which is a radical. It's a, a gift you give yourself. But I started trying different nutrition um, philosophies, eating this, eating that, you know, carbs, no carbs. And what I found was that just a certain way of eating um, which was completely opposite of what we're taught, completely opposite of the food pyramid. Uh, and I, for the first time in my adult life, I got abs, you know, six pack as an adult. I'm, I'm 42. And I got abs and I was blown away. And it was, it, again, completely opposite of what we're taught. And what I started doing is really following the money. And what I found is that if you follow the money, you realize that it's just money driven. It's not your best outcome driven, Patrick. You know, it's, and, you know, when we go in, and maybe buy something at Walgreens or wherever it is, would you like to donate a dollar to the Diabetes Foundation? I'm deeply empathetic for people who have diabetes. So no, but what I'd like is for them to turn the food pyramid upside down, we'd probably cut diabetes in half. I want the proper information and education out there so that people get the yeah. truth. Yeah. Because it matters. You know, you've got these little kids who are, you know, labeled ADD and put on pills when the reality is they're eating Captain Crunch for breakfast, a yeah. peanut butter and jelly sandwich for, for lunch. And I think... I know for a fact that most of that can be curtailed just by with health 
healthy eating. I, I'd love to hear your uh, rant on that, my friend. Oh, geez, I, <laughs> you we know? can talk a long time about that. But I, I, as a, as a nutritionist and and on the nutrition lecture circuit, sometimes I'm I'm also called upon to do that sometimes. Very cool. <laughs> When I began, it was just too overwhelming for most people. I just gave way too much information. You know, I started with water, and then I talked way too long on water, and then I went to this, this, and this. Really, it comes down to everything in moderation and eat real food, yeah. and eat food that's hopefully grown close to where you live, so it has an end of story. That's pretty much it. You know, is it is it healthy, fresh food? What is the source of this food? That's all you really need to know. And if it's in a box, a can, or a bag, well, it used to be food. It isn't anymore. And no matter what they put on the label, like you said, they're interested in you buying their product. They're not interested in your health. No matter what they say in the commercial or what they say in the box or the can or the bag, they want you to buy their product. And, and it's one of the reasons that uh, they the market for you know organic food that is driven up just because you know it has to be. You know they. Those other, you know, the big corporations, they can undersell everyone. And again, that's a that's another connection to the environment and to how we're treating the earth. And there's a lot of statistics I use. One of the great classes I was teaching in Africa was a global studies class. So other than the statistics I already had, I you know, I got to do a lot more research and it was hands on stuff and boy it it, it hits home there too in, in poorer countries because they don't have the resources. But they also don't have the longevity we have. But our longevity is is tailed with poor health. Disney. We might live longer, but we don't live healthier. That is for sure. So true. You know, and sadly, you know, HIV and AIDS is, 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 a, is a big killer in developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. But here's diabetes, and actually AIDS, the HIV is leveled off. Here's diabetes. Soon we'll pass it. Wow. Because they're adapting the SAD diet standard American diet ah. and it's happening in, in Europe it's happening in China and it's happening in sub-Saharan Africa and it's it's just empty calories you know full belly yeah. and it's 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 really it's really difficult and if if people could understand the hormonal factor you know mm -hmm. we have cravings because we have a hormonal imbalance we have too much sugar too little sugar too much salt too little salt that's why we have these these cravings as long as we don't bite and just go overboard with cravings, it's like people that drink two glasses of beer a night or two glasses of wine or before they go to bed they have a big bowl of cereal. Okay, instead of, and this is really one of the ways that I teach nutrition, don't just completely cut out the things you love, just replace yeah. it with something else once in a while and then just gradually it'll get a little better. Because wholehearted, you know, cold turkey, some people have that, but most people don't. I just heard a statistic um, on uh, another individual's podcast. He was interviewing a, a gentleman who was talking about people who quit smoking cold turkey. Um, cold turkey, no patch, no no Nicorette, anything like that. And the success rate is five, like five and a half percent. The people who quit, you know, eating bad foods, changing their lifestyle that way, their food eating habits is four and a half percent. So it's not very successful. I love what you're saying there because you start just taking everything out. It's like, man, that's a, that's a sad life. There's an addictive factor to it. There are people feel good when they eat carbohydrates, when they right. eat sugars and those types of foods. So like with my son, bless his heart. I love the guy. And man, the guy loves cereal. Guy loves carbs, big time. And so I try to pull everything away and it's just like, the guy's sad. So it's just, what we've done with, with him is, it's like, look, bud, if you'll just eat one of these green shakes a day, that's great. And so he's been committed to doing that. A few eggs in it, some spinach, some almond milk, and just to in, bring that into his life. And hopefully over time we'll bring in and introduce more healthy foods. Yeah. But make it um, not so abrupt because I just don't the success rate with it. It's yeah. I've not seen it been yeah, it's, it is. It's a tough one. And it's substitute honey for sugar. Simple. Really simple, and again, people they want their taste buds entertained, yeah. and, and you know, well, geez, organic food just it's you know if you if you flavor it right, and there's a lot of stuff to flavor, there's a lot of spices out there, and again, you have to educate yourself. Yeah. And uh, the nutritional program I might have sent it to you. It's nutritional guide for athletes. The first thing on the very top, number one, is educate yourself in nutrition. So again, why do they call upon me so that I can educate them? It was like you and I and Ross were talking about. 
you know, we we go and do this thing for this athlete. Well, we need to teach the coach because we're yeah. not always there. It's like when I go do clinics for coaches, f athletes, football players, whatever. I said, well, yeah, I need to teach you. I coach, I don't. Coach. I'm not at your. I'm not at your school. I need to teach you. And that's really the, 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 the most important thing is teach the people that are going to teach the people. I love it. That's why teacher education is really, really important. That's what I was doing. That was part of what I was doing in Africa. Because you now reach 100, you reach 200, and now we're reaching thousands. You leverage those individuals. You're taking people who have influence. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. That's something that along the lines of, of nutrition is, uh, or anything, is if it matters, immerse yourself in it. And one of the things that was one of the greatest gifts I gave myself. One of the first books I got that was a big game changer for me was uh, Suzanne Summers' uh, Eat Great, Lose Weight. It was about food combining. And did that, really learned what foods did to my body. Yeah. And then I read another book um, called Wheat Belly, and I eliminated a lot of wheat and sugar from my diet. Had radical, amazing results. Read The Paleo, you know, by Rob Wolf. And so, but what I found is that and it's what you're talking about with kids and teaching them. We all have different bodies, different systems. Some things are pretty much absolute. We know what's bad for our bodies. But I was amazed at how as I consistently immersed myself in new information, or information, not necessarily new, but maybe suppressed information about food, and I applied it, I could tell just over time what worked, what didn't work, the results I was getting, how I felt, and the energy levels I had. And I think it's really important for people to get very, um, that's what I would recommend any, to anybody, I, and I do, is immerse yourself in food and nutrition and just see what's out there and then try it. And it's been, a, it's been one of the biggest blessings we've given our family because a lot of, we talk about time with our kids, time with the people we love. Yeah. Because so many, right, people are just dropping off a couple bags of burgers and off we go. Yeah. We've included in our children in the shopping process. We hang out. We go through a, a book, like the, the new paleo book, Sarah Fragosa. I don't know if you know who she is. Great gal. Written a couple great paleo cookbooks. We'll go through and find, let the kids pick out their recipe, and then we'll go shop for that, the ingredients to that recipe. We'll come home, and we'll cook it together. And my daughter's chopping the onions. My son's firing up the grill. Yeah, right? Right, yeah. It has been amazing. It's just a gift we've given our family, and we feel better. We've got more energy. We're spending more time together, so... Yeah, you know, that's that's great. It's because you know, food is very therapeutic in every way, whether it's the prep, you know, the cooking or the eating. True, right? The meditative aspect of just a lot. it's amazing. And I have the, I have this great uh, uh, guy. I can't remember who wrote it, but it's about how to eat. And you know, I personally, you know, I play this game with my dad and, and friends, and family. If there was one thing you could change about me, what would it be? And some people don't like to do right. that. And then no you gay, think, brother. or else you play. Okay, just one, just each, one. Each one. Of them, okay, what would you change about yourself? Whoa, I don't like this game. But you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, et cetera, et cetera. My dad told me, he said, I wish you would eat slower. And that's, and it's so much healthier when you eat slower. And man, I, I learned that when I watched the Malawians eat in Africa. Man, they just they take their time doing everything. <laughs> really, really. Which is which is. Is good in some ways, and in other ways, it didn't work too well with a Western mindset. Yeah. But uh, boy, they they you know they enjoyed their food. They just they did they had two hour lunches. Wow. Or more, <laughs> you know. And they you know time is time is not a machine down there. You know it's it's time is just it's today. <laughs> it's not it's not rigid. And they're you know, living it's, it. It's not a machine. Yeah. It's not you know you got to be here. So yeah. Even though they had classes. You know, for college students, and you got to be here at this time. You know, it really didn't. You know, they didn't. They didn't bat an eye if they were late. You know, and I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard that. It's just like, oh well, well, we're good. Well, and again, this is again, it's a it's a Western mindset, and I really had to wrap my my own psyche around everything that we introduce here is 180 degree different than what they their culture. Is, is like or has been doing for there's there's thousands of years old we're a couple of hundred mm -hmm. you know so when it came to food uh, that was one thing that they did need some education on just because their science is really you know it's they don't have the science even though science doesn't have all the answers and you can usually figure things out just by watching nature but because they've been indoctrinated into Western habits you know they don't realize the effects of that that, that heavy sugar content mm. that they're putting in their food, you know, because a lot of times 
the, the only thing they drink because water's not that readily available it would be a Coke or Fanta. And man, one time I said, hey, orange juice. And it, I, I kind of, it doesn't look quite, I figured, no, this is, you know, they, they just have fruit here. So, oh, it was this, it was, might as, it was probably sugar with a little orange dye and then whatever water it took to make it liquid. Delish. Oh, man, <laughs> it just, it just killed me. But going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, you know, as far as, you know, sitting down with the family and that kind of thing and the time, that's really the most important thing, you know, what, what do you spend your time with when I when I go back to the thing? What do you what do you students what do they value? Yeah. Okay, so you say you value this. Now I want you to write down how much time you spend with these things you value. Oh, so you really value this, but this thing you said you valued, don't spend much time with it. So is it really valuable to you? Oh yeah. So you kind of you kind of wake up. Yeah, get them thinking. Oh, geez, yeah. And you know we say we value education in this country. I, I said where. Is there, how many commercials do you see for education? A couple about colleges, a couple of billboards about you know going on to college. But how much time do you spend with your kids? Mm. Just talking about science or English or school. Maybe you can't help them with their math, but you can certainly. And I was fortunate because both my parents are really bright, mm. you know, Smart. and, and PhDs and blah blah blah. And so education was always it wasn't pushed. It was just. There's a value. It's there's nothing more valuable in our society than education, as far as the things that we can achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, again, I, I was really fortunate in in that regard. And I I I just like school. I'm kind of an I like and I like the training for sports. Yeah. Most people I know they just want the result. You know, I want yeah. the degree, but I like the process. Yeah. Same thing with training. You know, I like going to train. And most of the, the athletes we talk to from Olympians on down, you know, well, once you get to the high school level, they don't have that experience yet. But most of them, yeah, it's, it's really the, the people I met, the experiences. And actually, Mac Wilkins, a uh, multiple medal winner, just one of the greatest throwers in the history of the throws. He brought his gold medal at one of the camps one time. And the kids, oh, wow. He said, you know, I keep this in a drawer. It doesn't. It's not sitting out anywhere because the most important thing to me was the training and, mm -hmm. and the fun stuff I did to get the there. That was a, a brief moment in time. I stood up there. It was really a really neat thing. But everything that happened to that point was what I remember. I love that. That's a metaphor for life. Yeah. I mean, it's just those, those moments. Our moments stacked up becomes our life. It's what are we doing with them. I, I, love, I love that philosophy and I love that when people get that, it is that process. It's the journey. And I've... We talk to people a lot. They say, you're going to be so successful. And I know that they're equating that to money and exposure. It's like, man, it's, when I chase that, the what if and when I get, then I'll be with such an empty uh, place to be. And I've been blessed with a lot of challenging experiences like a lot of people did. Hell, 07, 08 with the economy, that was a challenging reset for a lot of folks. And I think a lot of people like myself, especially those of us who got, have kids who went from here to here during the boom, and we like, when did, did that happen? Got very clear that this is it. You know, it's the find things that you are that we're passionate about that turns us on, lights us up, and then go all in on a daily basis and become curious. And that is the successful uh, that's a su successful life to me. You know, I, like was it uh, Earl Nightingale, the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. When you step foot in the gym, it's the process of am I going to be a little bit better today than I was yesterday on this technique? Am I going to be a little stronger? And that to me is really the juice. And it's so people are like, that's boring. You know, it's but I think that's really life. That's what it's about. Yeah, and that's kind of with, with our society today, we 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 just we want to be entertained so much. Yeah. You know, and each successive generation gets a little softer, you know. I'm not certainly as tough as my parents, et cetera, et cetera, just yeah. because life was harder because we didn't have the technology we have today. So now where are we gonna go from here? You know, supposedly our kids aren't going to live as long as, as we will because of, you know, the diseases, et cetera, et cetera. Even though we have this health care system, I wouldn't even call it a health care system, it's a sick care. Yeah. The only time we go is when we're sick. And I was going to uh, remark on this when uh, we were talking a little bit more about nutrition. In China, when Mao Zedong took control, he didn't. he knew he didn't have enough doctors for the large masses of people, so he invested in... Taoist alchemists to become the doctors for villages 
and their job was to keep the village healthy. And if someone got sick or injured, he had to pay them. Oh wow! So he had them doing qi kung and tai chi, and he made sure that the village was eating correctly. That oh. was his job. And one of the things that happens, I don't know if it happens now, maybe they've adapted Western medical ideology, I'm not sure, but from what I understand from some of my friends who have been in China, the first thing they ask you when you go to the doctor is, what do you eat? Mm. You know, who asked that here? They ask it when you have to go under, you know, yeah, for anesthesia because there might be a reaction, right. but, you know, you know, skin diseases, et cetera, et cetera, you know, bad breath. The reason we have bad breath or... or you know, stinky uh, gas is because of what we eat, what we put in us. You know, acne, hair, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's it. happening inside us, not the shampoo and everything right. else we put on top of us. That's really window dressing. It really is so important. Your blood, et cetera, et cetera. What's coming out of you is what you're putting in you. And you know, we 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 try to teach patience with athletes. Mm. It's really kind of difficult, though. We say you got to give a nutrition plan six months. you got to give a training plan at the minimum six weeks to see any kind of results. Now, you know, you talk about CrossFit and all these new things coming out, and, uh, you know, you, we've seen success with all these different programs just because it's the Hawthorne effect. They're comparing it to nothing. Mm. If, I, if I took you away from that and had you do this other program, you'd see results because it's new stimulus. Yeah. So, you know, that's how people make money. So, you know, good for them. And, and hopefully they're not hurting anyone in the process. And that's really the most important thing for when we train athletes, whether it's weightlifting or for any other sports. First thing is you don't want to hurt them right. so that they can't participate in their sport unless, of course, we're just training weightlifters. And then, we're, again, they're going to be more specific in what they do. But as far as anything else is concerned, the nutrition plans with, the, and I know we're, we're kind of moving off on this tangent here. It's good. It's, I like this is the the meat and potatoes. Where I'd like to like close it out with like the weightlifting aspect of things and your philosophy on Olympic style weightlifting and and what that does for folks. Well, one thing that's worked pretty well when I've had to speak in front of you know a lot of NC two A coaches, uh, high school coaches, and usually the camps are dotted unless it's just okay. You're going to go teach. You're going to do a clinic at Ohio State and you're going to do their strength coaches. But if it's at a camp, it's usually dotted with the coaches. They could be college guys, they could be high school, and then there's the athletes, could be college and high school. So what's worked the best is is showing the difference between different types of training. So you have bodybuilding, which is single joint most of the time. The skill level is really low. Right. Okay. But Athleticism, yeah, for the most part, is not really high with that. But it's always prefaced with, okay, what is first of all, what's your purpose for being in the weight room? Sure. What's your purpose for training? What is your goal? What are you trying to do? And we have four things for weightlifting. First is we want you to improve performance. That is in your sport. Second thing is we want to correct technique. That is, if you're doing something wrong in the weight room, we want to correct it. Third is to increase work capacity so that you can work harder and longer and train. And fourth is to help reduce the chance of injury. Mm -hmm. So those are the four things. All right, now, how are we going to progress? First, we're going to introduce you to the whole part, whole method, which is showing the whole and then teaching the parts. Rarely will you do the whole, unless you want to be a competitive weightlifter. Then it's a whole different thing. But if you're trying to get stronger, faster for your sport, then it's the parts are about all you're going to ever do. And you're never going to probably train above 90%. No reason to. No reason to max out unless we need to find out where you are. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as selling coaches on this kind of training versus that kind of training, you know, we break things down. Okay, bodybuilding. It has a part. It has a place. You know, maybe you have a, a joint instability. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it give you a little bit of confidence. But how is it? A, how is it going to apply to your sport? Then powerlifting, which we again, I'll. Uh, I'll give you this distinction. The United States is the only place in the world that you have to say Olympic weightlifting. If you go to anywhere in Europe, Asia, and you say you're a weightlifter, they know you do the snatch and the clean and jerk. Hmm. We're the only place because we have, you know, if you say you're a weightlifter, that could mean bodybuilding. Who knows? Right. So powerlifting is actually misnamed because there's no power involved in powerlifting. Power is a combination of speed and strength over time. Hmm. You know, it doesn't, you know, if you have a max on there, 
And I, I always I give bench pressing a, a really bad rap, even though I I benched before. But again, it's the it's the hey, you know the measure yeah, stick in the way of yeah. Well, you know why people like it because they can lay down and do it. <laughs> but anyway, you know I I and I tell some jokes about guys, you know, big weightlifter guys. But anyway, uh, it has its place too, you know, because it's great stability, helps you get strength in the pack if you're a discus thrower, you know, increases deltoid strength for the shot. You know, other things, you know, for pushing away if you're an old lineman. But there's no speed involved. Mm. There's no foot movement. There's no, the neuromuscular component is really small. And neuromuscular meaning nerves with muscles. Mm. Now, for the snatch and the clean and jerk, the neuromuscular component is very, very high because you can't perform the movements without speed and technique. And uh, sadly, a lot of guys that I've, I've trained, as weightlifters slash powerlifters, you know, they, they can deadlift the gym, squat the whole building, and then they come and try to do Olympic lifts, and they're really humbled because they can't do as much as, and it's, and the technique is difficult. And another thing, it I, is difficult. And I, I say, you now, coaches, athletes, if all you did was the Olympic lifts, you know, snatch and clean jerk, it would take you four to five years to master if that's all you did. Now, if you're going to incorporate this into your training, you really have to back it off. And are you and your athletes willing to humble yourself to learn the lifts before you add intensity slash weight? Wow. And then we show them this chart, and I'll, I'll send it to you. It's, it's Watts. And Pat O'Shea, we were, I was talking to you about from Oregon State. Yeah. He's really the 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 the, uh, the pioneer for the United States anyway, and uh, his book Quantum Strength Power Two is an excellent excellent book on this type of training. But they measured how many watts are produced when someone did their body weight for one rep. So they had a woman and a man, and he weighed 100 kilos, which is 220. She weighed 75 kilos, which is 165, and they did one rep with that weight for bench, squat, deadlift, snatch, and clean and jerk. And they measured how many watts they produced when they did this one rep. So for the bench, I think they produced 300 watts. For the deadlift and the back squat, 1,100 watts. The first pull of the snatch, which is from the floor just to your knees, 3,300 watts. Oh, my gosh. The second pull, which is from the knees to the high pull, with your arms straight, 5,400 watts. Oh. So put these two pulls together. That's 8,700 watts of power compared to 300 That's amazing. for a bench. And and the coaches look at this and whoa. And even the guys I, I trained that were Olympians from Pasco, I wish I would have known this stuff when I was younger. You know, from the knees to here, 5,400 watts. Now, if you do a clean and jerk, uh, you add another 5,400 watts of power because you clean and then you jerk, which is also generating force. So what does that result to in, in results and outcomes? Uh, and that's another thing. One of the articles I wrote for USA Weightlifting was called the non-correlation of strength to performance. And there isn't any. The only correlation we've seen of how weightlifting applies to a sport was a 2% correlation from weightlifting to the throws. You know, shot, discus, jab on hand. Wow. That's it. 2%. Because you, you can be the strong, and, and you know, I, I don't know how many guys you saw like this, but it's it's still happening. You know, we have a lot of weight room athletes. Yeah. You know, these giant kids today, you know, they can squat 500, bench 350, and they can only fill the shot 40 feet. Right. You know, because it's not like doesn't apply, it doesn't apply in there. So we're because we're not applying it. You know, and again, these slow movements. You know, first of all, they put your posture at risk. And if you do the Olympic lifts correctly, your posture is impeccable. So there's there's a lot of pros and cons, and and a lot of people give me a hard time because you would just train all the athletes like Olympic weights. I said no, but that would be the bulk of their training because it's neuromuscular, and and this is what all the coaches are talking about. You don't have to lift Olympic weights to do Olympic movements, uh -huh. you know. And again, it's a neuromuscular component. And so. That's something I like to get into. I like to have you back and I like to chat more about it. Just like really dig into this type Great. of information because I'd love to see how we can get uh, you know mothers and and just average Joes utilizing these type of, of techniques, this type of lifting, and getting results just so they can hike more, they can play with their kids more, they can have longevity and feel great. 
I'd love to see how that, you know, if we can apply that to those people, can they? Yeah, let me uh, give you one example. Uh, a study was done, I can't remember where and how long the study was done, but it was carried out at a, a nursing home. And now you can have 10 kilo bars that are out there. You can have 5 kilo bars, 15, 20. 20 is the standard for men and 15 for women. But you can get smaller bars. And, and what they did is they had these people that were at this nursing home do Olympic movements, the parts. The movements. Yeah. They didn't have weight. They had bars or, or dowels or they had PVC pipe. But the fact that it was, it's, it's, a, it's a, a neuromuscular movement. Mm -hmm. Some of them were able to move out of the nursing home. The only reason they were there is because they were not mobile. You know, they had to be in a wheelchair some of the time, and they started having them do these movements. You showed this 78-year-old lady. She had a bar overhead, and I don't know how heavy it was, maybe 15 kilos, and she was doing overhead squats. Wow. And because the, the technical part of it, and again, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be high intensity. It's just the movement itself is neuromuscular as opposed to single joints, which have their place, sure. you know, bench press, squat. And, and squat is a little problematic because you really have to have some flexibility. Right. And uh, the back is the key. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks it's the legs. It's To hold the lever, your back has to be strong. And, of course, deadlifting, there's a thing called an, a Romanian deadlift, which is much healthier. And I know a lot of people swear by deadlifts and this and that, but no matter how you slice it, the back takes so much pressure. Yeah. And... Again, the last thing we want to do for any athlete or any person is injure them while they're in, you know, while they're training. Right. So again, when you're holding a bar like this and your posture's up, and then you just do a pull, you're and and you're and you're and you're extending the hips, and you're you might be not jumping, but you're moving the feet a little bit. Boy, you don't have to have a lot of weight, and your right. posture is is honed. And you're getting like you know with the watts scenario you're talking about, you're getting a lot of return on investment from the, the from your body. Right. So you can do a lot more with just those movements versus a whole lot of the other movements. Right. Right. Single joint. Right. And again, I I would I would I would do this as part of someone's training. Again, it comes down to what is someone's purpose for training? Yeah. Why are you doing this? You know, and it's it's kind of like the labels you talked about uh, for uh, and let me recall this. Um, Anyway, it, it comes down to what we want to label things. It's, oh, the paleo diet. And, yeah. and I see these labels, and I kind of I step back from any kind of trendy labeled thing. So eating correctly it doesn't, doesn't need to be named anymore. Right. Training correctly for you doesn't need to be CrossFit or, you know, the... P90X. Yeah, you know, whatever. It, you know, things. okay, let's... Which are all good. Yeah. Let's, but, again, that's people are promoting their product, which yeah. is great. But let's... What do you want? What's your goal? What's your purpose? You know, is this mm -hmm. what's what is the end result? You know, you have your short term reachable, your long term, your dream goal, whatever you want to do. But that's really, I think, where we miss. You know, we we oh god, this sounds great, and then we buy into it wholeheartedly. Yeah. Without, because we 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 trust who we're being trained by. Which, again, in this country, you know, you take a weekend course and you're certified. <laughs> right. Well, that's what I'd love to do, Pat. Is you know, I would love to to get with you again and and have those conversations about some of the different movements. Show people some of the things that they can do even at home with the broomstick and just some of the things that you're talking about, where they can just feel them, feel it out, you know, and get accustomed to the movements and doing them correctly. Yeah, and we can take that further. If you're right. up for it, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Let's roll cameras, baby. And show people what they're <laughs> for sure. Yeah, we can cool. do that. No problem. I love that. Cause that's one of the things I'm. Uh, I'd love to uh, to get with you, you know, and just have you kind of critique my my form and all that. Make sure all I'm right. doing it right. Cause I, that's my key, man. Is I, I want to be hanging out with my kids, my grandkids, be able to be mobile, yeah. hiking and doing stuff right. you know, well into my 80s. So yeah, brother, I, I'm grateful for you spending the time today, man. Well, hey, I know you've got to go teach a class here. Yeah, coming gonna, up. Yeah, we got some kids, so. Well, brother, thanks so much, man. I'm um, gonna have you back. So all right. you gotta you gotta commit, man. You gotta yeah. come back. All right. Hey, you got more to talk thanks about. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks everybody. I hope uh, you enjoyed Patrick. To find Pat, Pat, what's your email? What's your? How can people get in touch with you? Coach Corb at gmail .com, and that's all lowercase, just the word coach, and then C O R B. Coach Corb at gmail .com. Cool. Appreciate you, Pat. Thanks. Have a great one.